So we wrote down Polchinski CRG. I'll just write that down. So that it was something like this. So using the usual shorthand notation where x is the field. And uh, g, this g is the propagator. So uh, g initial is the original propagator, which is e to the power of minus p squared by lambda naught squared by p squared. g final is what we call the low energy propagator, which is and g i minus g f, which is what we call the high energy propagator. So this is the g, suppressing all the momentum indices. And I wrote down uh, another equation. So this is psi prime is just e to the power of minus the Wilson action, the interacting part of the Wilson action. And if you define psi as the f e uh, full thing, which is, then the equation for psi is And this is very similar to the Wilson equation that we had uh, in the first lecture, except for this factor of g inverse. So his, Wilson's g and these g are basically logarithms of each other. One of them. And we wrote down a solution. This is Polchinski's equation. So the solution is, uh, this is Polchinski's equation for that. And it's just like the high, uh, Schrodinger equation. So the solution for this is psi prime xf tf. Sorry, xf minus xi squared integral of this dxi this is the integration and the solution for this you can obtain it from this by adding the uh, action is written symmetrically as psi xf tf A little more complicated, xf by gf minus xi by gi squared. Okay, so this is uh, this is the this solution is also very similar to what we had in the Wilson example, and remember that all these solutions are of the generic form. This is important to note that this uh, integral integration kernel is of the generic form minus half a squared xf minus z xi squared. It's of that form. Okay, so the z is basically the thing that does the scale uh, uh, coarse graining from the in variable xi to the variable xf, and it occurs in all the Green's functions as scaling factors. A is just a constant which basically tells you the width of this. And uh, it occurs mainly in the two-point function. It's not very important. The important thing is this. And if you compare this with this, you see that the z is basically gf by gi. It's the ratio of these two. Okay. And uh, I, I think I also wrote down this equation. So this is the equation in terms of psi, in terms of s, it's just ds dt is minus half g dot d squared s by dx squared. Okay, so here it's not a linear equation, it has a nonlinear term. And uh, this part implements a scale transformation. And these things basically do the contraction. So uh, uh, maybe I should have said this in the beginning. That diagrammatically, what this does is if you have a, a vertex, say a lambda phi 4 vertex, this contracts two of them and produces a phi squared vertex. So it's a self-contraction. 
and uh, there's a propagator here and this measures the rate of change of the propagator with respect to the cutoff. So it tells you how this contraction, it's like a normal ordering contraction affects the, gives a, uh, well, how the 5 4 term affects the mass quitter. Okay. And uh, this thing is uh, more like a tree diagram. So if you have a 5 4 term and another 5 4 term, this will uh, contract one leg from each with a g dot there. So what it does is it produces a 5 6 interaction out of a 5 4 interaction. So that's how the Wilson action gets built up becomes enormous. So if you uh, iterate this, this phi 6 term will come back and produce a phi 4 term through this diagram, and then the phi 4 term will produce a phi squared term. So as you iterate the equations, uh, the loops that you see in perturbation theory uh, get done. Okay? But here, th at, uh, this, as a differential equation, this is all you're doing. Okay. No, uh, what, what I mean by I, yeah. So if you imagine, um, yeah, you do, suppose you're doing perturbation theory, you start with let's say a phi square and a phi fourth term, then to order lambda you will generate phi six term and then phi eight and lambda square and so on. So this is the structure of the equation. The scaling term is what implements this part. It's the coarse graining. Yeah, that's like the wave function renormalization. So maybe when I when I when I talk about the uh, anomalous dimension, that will become clear. So now, then I talked about a fixed point, and I said the uh, statement about the fixed point was that once you approach the fixed point, the action doesn't change after you do iterations. But to see that the action doesn't, doesn't change, because you're, after all, you're scaling. You're changing, at e, if you think in terms of discrete iteration, it, e, you're changing lambda to lambda by 2, and then lambda by 4, and so on, in a discrete version. This is a continuous version of that. And if it's a fixed point and it's not changing, clearly, you must express things in dimensionless variables, because in dimensional terms, everything is going to change. So express. In dimensionless variables, so what are the variables in the theory? Basically, there's phi, and of course p. So you write phi is some uh, lambda to the power of the dimension of phi times phi bar, and this is p, and you write it as a function of a dimensionless p, where p is lambda times P bar. Okay, so P bar is dimensionless. Phi bar is dimensionless. By dimensionless, I mean the engineering dimension. It's a dimensionless quantity, and of course, as you change lambda, the scaling changes. So it's always in terms of your current lambda. So if you change lambda to lambda by two, then in, for the new thing, you have to use lambda by two here. So this thing effectively keeps changing. These things keep changing if you keep that fixed. And the express in terms of dimensional, dimensionless variables, S should not change. Which means ds by dt equals 0. But I'll put a bar here to say that it's all in terms of fixed. So everything inside here is dimensionless, because the action itself is dimensionless. Fields are dimensionless, momenta are dimensionless, the coupling constants are dimensionless. Everything is dimensionless. And once you make it, and it's all dimensionless in terms of the scale, the current scale. And once you express it in terms of dimensionless numbers, there's no further t dependence. That's the statement of the fixed point. So I mentioned that to, to make this, when you make this transformation, this ds by dt is not the same as this ds by dt. Because when you write phi like this, you get some extra factors of that, of lambda. And then when you differentiate, you'll get extra terms from this. So, so the 
In other words, uh, another way of saying is you start with dimension full coupling constants, you get some powers of lambda, making them dimensionless. And so if you write everything in terms of dimensionless numbers, this derivative and this derivative are two different things because the powers of lambda separating them. And we worked out the connection. Um, I can find it. Yeah, here's the connection. So I wrote down S of phi bar as a general expansion So as a first step, this is my original coefficients in my Wilson action, multiplying the fields. I took out all the, I take out all the powers of lambda from here. These powers of lambda come from the integration. Now I'll expand this in powers of p and write this as um, some dimensionless number labeled by 2m times p bar i dot p bar j to the power of m uh, times lambda to the power of 2m times lambda n d phi so now these numbers are just numbers all the p dependence is out all the lambda and these are dimensionless numbers so what is the all the lambda dependence it's this it's this and that so this lambda dependence of course uh, when it multiplies all this it becomes dimensionless. It has to become dimensionless. Okay? But when you do uh, ds by d phi, so when you do d, so what's the connection between this and that? I'll just write that down. So vn 2m lambda is lambda uh, times lambda to the power of n minus 1 d plus 2m plus n d phi c this we can define as the dimensionless that's all that, that's what it is yeah yeah characterizes the fixed point meaning it has to satisfy this it's a form of the action where if you do the rg transformation it doesn't change rg transformation tells you how you're supposed to evolve in time so you evolve in time and you find it doesn't change. You get back the same action. That's what it means. Okay. So remember, ds by dt is equal to something, all this. So this has to come out 0. Uh, suppose uh, some other point where uh, uh, is, is not formed in that Yes. Taking the derivative means acting with this. Because you, uh, well, if you have an explicit solution as a function of t, you obviously you can just take the derivative. You don't have an explicit solution. You have to, time evolution is given by this operation. It's like a Schrodinger's equation, right? D psi by dt is h psi. So h equals 0 is your fixed point, right? So you have to solve for that. Yeah, it's all a function of phi bar. I call it S bar to make it dimensionless. This one. Ah, yeah, yeah. So S, that's just, it's the same thing. So it's actually the same thing. It's just a different notation. Because anyway, the action is dimensionless. So there are no further powers of lambda going from here to here. So, uh, the, so the point of this is the time derivative of this is not the same as the time derivative of that because of all these guys. Okay. And uh, and you can see where these are coming from. These are just coming from the dimension, the, the engineering dimension of the various objects. So this came from all the momentum integrals. This came from all the momenta in the vertices. This came from all the fields. Okay. 
So in any given term, this has a well-defined value. You can just write it out. There's no, it's just kinematics. So we define this operator. Yeah. So if we were to uh, try to find V bar in M, yeah. it's not like a Taylor expansion. So it's like you just multiply the momentum factor. No, no, this is a Taylor expansion. Yeah. So I'm assuming that this is known as a function of the piece. So you can expand it in general as a powers of piece. And uh, I'm denoting the denoting these terms by that. It's just a notation. Ah, good point. Yeah. So the, the, the so this goes back to the whole point that Wilson action is always uh, analytic in P at zero because you are always integrating out finite number of degrees of freedom. So you always have such an expansion. Um, yeah, so, so, so when you differentiate, you get some extra terms which are proportional to all those things, which you can just keep track of term by term, and you can write it down, which I did last time, and we give it a name, we call it, we call that term, so all this, you can, so minus of this, 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 I define as, so I can write this in terms of counting n phi times d plus d phi plus n p minus d. So this power is basically that, where n phi counts the number of phi's in any term, n p counts the number of p's in any term, and then it's multiplied by uh, the dimension of space time plus the dimension of the field minus d. So this object is just that. As a, think of this as an operator acting on any given vertex will produce those numbers. So it's easy to define that. And it's given a name, we just call it, um, G dilatation. So in, our, in my notation, this part was called, this is the RG transformation, so we call it G RG. So on the left hand side, when I go to dimensionless variables, I'll get an extra piece corresponding to this, because when I differentiate this, I'll get D by DT of this, plus these terms equals D by DT of that. Okay? That's what I did last time. So your equation gets modified to uh, this derivative is is this derivative, so you can define a, so maybe I, what I'll do is I'll call this ds by dt, and here I'll call it ds, ds by dt. This becomes equal to grg s plus, so this is the effect of the rescaling, where you write everything in terms of dimensionless momenta. So that's not, not very complicated. So now we have an equation in terms of everything is dimensionless. Okay, so I, I ended by saying that putting this equal to zero should give the fixed point, but I said it's the naive fixed point. Why? Because because of the problem about uh, field uh, redefinition, field rescalings, renormalizations that you're allowed to do. So uh, that will introduce the notion of anomalous dimension. Let me get to that quickly. So that's the main point. If you understood that, this you. So here's my, uh, I'll just give you an illustrative example without any, suppose your action is like this. This is your dimensionless action. So your Wilson action is going to be in polynomial, non, non, non polynomial, all, all, all powers. I'm just writing it on a few of the leading terms. Then you can have high terms. And everything is dimensionless here. Okay? So you define your bar parameters to be dimensionless. Now you go, so what, how did we define these terms? Phi was defined as lambda to the power of d phi. I, I did that there, phi bar. And p was defined as, I'll write it here, p is lambda p bar. Now I go, I do, uh, let me do a discrete thing. I change lambda to lambda by two, integrated half the modes. And suppose when I do that, I get a different action. So first of all, when I do that, I have to define a new phi bar, uh, by bar in terms of lambda by two. Okay, so my new phi bar will be, and my new p, p bar will be 
So when I write my new action, I have to also do this rescaling. So let's assume that's done. So everything is now in terms of lambda by 2. So this is my, call it 5 bar old and 5 bar new if you want. Just a dummy variable anyway. So let's assume that the action comes back to something that looks superficially different. So I'm just going to change things in an obvious way. You'll see what I'm doing. I'll just say I'll, it becomes So I've written it in a way that makes it obvious what I'm doing. Suppose your action comes out like this. So S lambda by 2 is this. Okay, As a result of doing this. So I've done the RG, I've done this rescaling, and this is what I get. Now, it's obvious for those of you who uh, uh, know that about field theory that this is the same physical action as that. Why? Because it's a, just a dummy variable. This I can redefine this and call it a new phi, and you see, then it becomes exactly the same as that. Okay. So you should not conclude that you're not at a fixed point if if it goes from here to here. It is at a fixed point. It's the same action, physically the same action. So what 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 would you do? You what you would do is let's uh, what I've done is let's call this root two phi bar p bar equals phi tilde p bar. Okay. So in terms of phi tilde, this action is now exactly the same. I won't write all of it. Now it's exactly the same, and you see that it's a fixed point. Okay. So what has been done? Now what is this um, phi tilde what, what, see already phi bar, uh, let's see, when you go from here to here, this phi bar uh, new is bigger than the phi bar old by a factor of uh, 2 to the power of d phi, right? Because uh, my, my units have reduced by a factor of 2. So an object with dimension d phi, if this is held fixed, this guy is bigger by a factor of 2 to the power of d phi. Okay, so my phi bar is already bigger than this phi by a factor of 2 to the power of d phi. Now what I'm finding is that in addition to that, this phi, when you go to this, this variable, this has an extra factor of root 2. So, your, uh, so for each iteration, effectively, what is the scaling that happens? There's a factor of 2 to the power of d phi due to the naive uh, dimensional change. Then there's a factor of root 2 because you've done this change. So, and uh, root 2, you don't realize, is just, it's just the square root of 2 here. So effectively, what you got is you got uh, lambda to the power of, um, so I can write it like this. Uh, so your net scaling is a factor of 2 to the power of d phi plus half. Okay. This is the root 2 extra factor that came from this. This is the 2 to the power of d phi that came because of this change. So we've got a scaling of 2 to the power of d phi plus half in this process. So it's as if the dimension of your field is not d phi, but it's d phi plus half. So this, this extra factor of root 2 that happens has that effect. Okay. So this uh, extra factor, uh, so you, if you now, if you want to, uh, write this in terms of continuous variables, you can express the whole thing in terms of lambda and say that your, you can put all this back into your definition of phi and say that your phi is lambda to the power of d phi plus half times phi tilde of p bar. Okay. So, it, so you, now you get the factors of, uh, extra factor of root 2. However, uh, this is not quite kosher because you don't want to change the engineering dimension. Okay? Engineering dimension fixes that. So what you should do is don't write it like this. Write it like this. So this part, you keep it dimensionless because you don't want to change the This has to be dimensionless. The engineering dimension of that is fixed. So you can't change the engineering dimension and introduce our parcel lambda. But you 
This changes the scaling dimension. In other words, as lambda changes, you'll get some dimensionless number, which is what you want, but it doesn't affect the engineering dimension. So this is some arbitrary scale. I called it lambda not here as the starting scale, but it could be any mu or anything. So there's some, but the point is there is an extra dependence on lambda, which comes just because of the scaling. So effectively, this d5 plus half is the new scaling dimension of your field. Okay. So in general, more generally, it won't be half. It will be some other number. I've just chosen half to illustrate. So in general, your equation will look like phi equals uh, lambda to the power of d phi times lambda by lambda naught to some that's what it will look like. Okay. So this is called the anomalous dimension. Anomalous dimension. Now, of course, you can ask why is this important? Because we said field redefinitions don't really matter. It doesn't change the physics. But it matters if you're looking for a fixed point and you want to write an equation like this, you have to keep track of that. I just showed you, if you don't keep track of that, it won't look like a fixed point. You won't find ds by dt is 0. Only if you keep track of that and allow that change, you can get it to this form. And then you see that this and this are the same. So in order to see the fixed point nature of your action, you have to choose the variables correctly. So if you choose to work in the original variables, then you have to be able to recognize uh, that this is the same as that. So that's it's a little harder to do. I mean, you have to keep track of all the powers of phi everywhere and make sure that it's exactly the same factor, et cetera. So it's more convenient to rescale everything, make this precisely half, and then require that uh, Nothing depends on t. So it's a systematic way of doing it. And to do that, you have to get the right get the right eta. So in this case, you have to get that root 2 correctly. Otherwise, you won't see that it's fixed. So associated with every fixed point, there is some parameter like that, which you have to fix. Okay. So if you have uh, got that point, that's the main point. So this is for the. Uh, scalar field, and you can do the same thing in a more general RG if you have other operators. So now, uh, let me show you why it's useful to know this eta, because the way it's been described, uh, the field redefinitions have no effect on the physics. It's just a matter of convenience. You choose an eta so that the equations look nice. But it has some computational benefits. You know, that you can predict things. So I'll just illustrate that with a simple example. Suppose you calculate the two-point function, phi bar, oh, I call it q bar. So let me erase all this. So uh, this is a completely dimensionless quantity. Okay. So it has to be some function of uh, p, the momenta. It has to be of the form p bar to the power of a by translation invariance. It has to be of that form. This is dimensionless. This is dimensionless and it's translation invariant. And it can't depend on anything else. At the, at the fixed point, it has to be, have that form. Times some pure dimensionless number. Okay. Um, so Let's go back and calculate phi p, phi q. Oh, some number. It's going to be some power of p bar. So imagine you're doing a, a you're calculating the two-point function in some limit. Uh, so this, if we now put put back, let's calculate this. If you calculate this object, put back all the powers of lambdas. Suppose you, uh, by you would reach some point. Yeah. No, no. Once you are at the fixed point, you you're not going to change. RG by definition, it won't change. So you won't. Okay, you will only asymptotically approach the fixed point. To actually be at the fixed point, you have to tune the parameters and choose that. Okay? And one. 
Well, you can flow from near a fixed point to another fixed point. But if you're exactly at the fixed point, by definition, nothing changes. It's just sitting there, right? Fixed point means you, it doesn't change in energy. That's the definition of a fixed point. So you, you don't flow from there. So, okay. So, from, uh, if you flow from near fixed point yeah, then you can, some other fixed point, right. so how do you change that parameter eta? Ah, so you have to, when you approach the other fixed point, you will find some other eta. So that has to be found by calculation. Eta will depend on the fixed point. Well, it, at a fixed point, it has a different value, but in general, it will change as you flow along the trajectory. But yeah, in general, you'll keep doing these renormalizations. So if you put all the powers of, uh, you use that transformation phi, relating phi and phi bar, you'll get an expression of this type, lambda to the power of 2 d phi, lambda by lambda naught, to the power of eta, p by lambda to the power of a, lambda to the power of d. So I've gone back to dimension full variables. So you get factors of, you go from the delta function to with the dimension less p to the dimension full p, you get factors of lambda, and then you get these factors from the field wave functions, etc. I mean the fields. Uh, and this is of the form. Uh, what is the definition of d phi? Remember that for a field of momentum p, the dimension d phi is uh, minus d by 2 minus 1 in p space. So if you put that all in, you will find that this is lambda to the power of minus 2 plus eta minus a by lambda naught to the power of eta. That's what it's going to look like. But now here comes the predictive power. This is calculated. This is supposed to be equal to what you calculate in the Baer theory. If, the, if you've done the RG right, your correlation functions are the same. So this cannot depend on lambda, because lambda is an arbitrary parameter that you introduced. So the powers of A and this must cancel. So that tells you that A is basically 2 minus eta, or 2 plus eta, uh, minus 2, what? whatever. Uh, So a has to, this a has to equal this. So then you conclude that a is minus 2 plus eta. Because it can't depend on lambda. That's the way it usually works in continuum RG also. And then you conclude that this dependence must be p bar to the power of or 1 by p bar to the power of 2 minus eta or in dimension full terms, it's 1 by p bar to the power of 2 minus eta times lambda naught eta. So you have to have some scale here to compensate. The engineering dimension has to be 1 by p squared, the way I've sort of uh, defined it. And uh, the lambda naught has to compensate for this extra power. And what lambda naught you choose is not important. It could be anything, but this gives you. So uh, from the fact that a field has anomalous dimensions, you can get some information about correlation functions, which you know anyway from all the uh, kalin semanzik uh, etc. for correlation functions. Sorry, the, the phi bar, phi bar correlated. So yeah. In computing that, that knows about lambda. It's computed with this uh, S lambda, S bar lambda bar, yeah. Well, it doesn't know about lambda in the sense this is a completely, no, uh, if you're calculating at the fixed point, there is no explicit lambda dependence in that, right? It's a fixed point. So the action has no explicit lambdas. It's a dimensionless thing. And everything is dimensionless. So this has no lambda dependence, no explicit lambda dependence, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, the notion of a fixed point is that it doesn't depend on lambda. The action doesn't depend on lambda. Lambda lambda no, you're computing this from S bar. S bar is the fixed point action. It has no explicit lambdas in it. So this doesn't know about lambda. The fixed point action has. Yeah, okay, but we are approaching the fixed point. 
Ah, if you're near the fixed point, there could be terms down by powers of lambda naught, which is your, let's say, your bare scale, which could have some information about lambda. So if you if you take the limit, huh? yeah. yeah. You can get corrections like that, yeah. And uh, what happens to those? Just yeah. So the fixed, at precisely at the fixed point, you have to get this form. Because, as I said, this action has no. It's a purely dimensionless action. There is no information about any scale. Of course, I'm assuming that your your original cutoff, ultraviolet cutoff, lambda naught, doesn't enter into this. You're far enough away from the original, the bare lambda naught. Bayer theory is lambda not sufficiently large that it doesn't enter here. You could, in principle, get terms of order 1 over lambda naught. But that I'm assuming is. So I, so maybe I shouldn't call this lambda naught. I should just call this some arbitrary scale, mu. This need not be identified with the original. The original scale of the Bayer theory, you can take that arbitrary large far away from your fixed point location, or, or your scale lambda location. And those terms don't affect you. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. At the fixed point, uh, they're all small, but they're all non-zero. You have to tune an infinite number of parameters to be at the fixed point. So, do you keep higher dimensional operators intact, or if you want to be exact, you have to keep everything? If you want to be exact, you have to keep everything. Yeah. And we do, uh, want to yes. Be yes. Right? Yeah. So there are all those terms sitting there. Right. Uh, one over one over. Yes. Yes. So only if you what, no, not one over. Wait, 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 you're talking about lambda naught or lambda? lambda no, no, S, the f you're talking about the original bare lambda naught. Yeah. That has been taken to, inf let's assume that's infinity. Oh, we are worried about the lambda dependence. The S, the Wilsonian lambda, the Wilsonian action has lambda terms in it. The, see, these things are all functions of, where is my V? Yeah, they all have lambdas in them to, for dimensional reasons. So remember from the point of view of the low energy effective action S, this lambda is your UV cutoff, and all your P's are supposed to be smaller than, I mean, they don't have to be, but it's supposed to describe the low energy physics, right? So this is like the UV cutoff of your effective theory. The original lambda naught of the bare theory, you can assume is infinite. No, so uh, it depends, as I said, it depends on what you're doing. I mean, you integrated it from lambda naught, which is, let us say, infinity, all the way down to lambda. And you have left, you're left with phi L, and the phi H's have been integrated out. And this theory is describing this region. So the P that you have is supposed to be less than lambda. But as I said, because it's analytic, it actually has information about everything. But if you keep just the lowest order terms, it, it has P information about P less than lambda. So these terms are all, will have higher terms down by P by lambda. P, so th those are these guys. No, this I just introduced some scale to make this dimensionless. So maybe I shouldn't call it lambda, I'm call it mu. Some scale to make it dimensionless. Some reference scale where I define uh, phi this scale to be 1, that's all. So this doesn't have to be identified with the lambda naught of the bare theory. Yeah, so I, that's confusing. Yeah. What about lambda naught? Yeah. Lambda naught is taken to infinity. Yes. But not 1 over lambda. Well, if you're right at the fixed point, the correlation length is infinite. Yeah. So if you're, so there'll be, so there'll be some parameter that you have to tune, to, like a mass parameter or a relevant variable that you tune to get to the f critical surface. If you're at the, you don't even ha at the critical surface, the correlation length is strictly infinite. And the fixed point lies on the critical surface. So the correlation length is infinite. Sorry. Oh, because I said yeah, this or the, the theory, the original theory, bare theory, doesn't know about this lambda. It's an arbitrary cutoff you introduced. So it has to be independent of lambda. So that's the usual RG argument that correlation functions don't depend on this capital lambda. OK, so now um, what I have to do is to tell you how to implement this and write down a fixed point equation 
so we're running out of time so i'll just finish that So uh, I'll just motivate the fixed point equation and I don't have time to work out the algebra, but I'll write it. So, so the idea is the following. Remember what we want to do is to define a field, normalized, call it a normalized field whose kinetic term is always half. Okay. So I'm going to define, oh, where is this? I'm going to define psi as some e to the power of I have to do a scale, so now x is my, here I've used the notation phi, but here I'm using the notation x. x has to be scaled by those factors. So how do you implement the scaling? You, you introduce an operator like this. So this will scale the fields by some amount, and I'll choose this so that this fee, the, uh, uh, the action written in terms of these x's uh, is normalized. So psi n is e to the power of minus s has a normalized kinetic term. This one doesn't. And I choose my a so that that happens. Okay. And what am I going to choose a as? I know what I have to choose. So wait, so now there are two scalings. Remember the dimension, the engineering dimension and the anomalous dimension. The engineering dimension is sort of trivial. I've taken into account by this g del, so I won't worry about that. Okay? I only worry about the anomalous dimension. So uh, uh, that's why I'm using this notation x. So I, let's forget about the engineering dimension part of it. Just This is only the anomalous part. Okay? So I have to choose a to be equal to that, this, this thing. So a has to be basically eta by 2 times t. Remember, lambda is like most like e to the power minus t. Okay. So I have to choose my a as uh, eta by 2 times t. That's the scaling that I have to do. And um, I'm going to write down the fixed point equation with, with this variable. So all that's going to happen is, so this will be times some operator. So this instead of writing x d by dx, I'll just call it n. Then what does the n do? It counts number of fields. Because x d dx just does that. If you have x, it counts 1. x squared will count 2. x cubed will count 3. So it just counts. Okay. So when you, how does this affect it? Just like, g, just like this term, when you differentiate it, you'll get an extra contribution due to that in addition to the derivative on that. So that's an extra term you'll get. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise that your new equation looks like this. So what? So of course, this is. So as I said, this is always there. I'm suppressing this part for the moment. This is the effect of the anomalous dimension. So uh, in principle, one can stop here. All I have to do is to give you an expression for this n. Okay, and there's some subtlety there because I just said n is a ddx, so it has a ddx component, but it's not the full story. Okay, so the remaining few minutes, I'm going to tell you about how you get this n I'll, uh, without too much detail. So this is what is called a composite operator. So why is this n different from just x d d x? Because if you imagine doing this on your bare action, as you evolve in the RG, this operator, uh, the usual x d d x, is no longer x d d x as it evolves down. Okay? So let's see what happens to it. So let me define for you the notion of an, uh, a composite operator. I'll do that very quickly. I won't do all the algebra. So what I've done is I've I have most of it typed up. I'll just put it up on my home page, and you can check the algebra if you're interested. But here, I'll just outline the point. 
So the notion of a composite operator, if I can find it, So here's the, so the, the notion of a composite operator here is slightly different from the notion in the usual RG where you worry only about the divergence, divergences. Uh, the other thing is here you're not necessarily talking about the one particular reducible action, it's just the full Wilson action. So there's some differences, but this is a systematic way of uh, dealing with it and all the terms that you naively associate with composite operators will be here and there'll be some more terms here. But here it's more general and um, the definition is, it's a very specific definition. Suppose you have a high energy theory and you're integrating out the fields and you insert some operator. So this is the action you normally do. So this is my original partition function, and I, I want to insert this operator here. And the question is, what, what operator is equivalent to this in the low energy theory? So uh, I say this is equal to some operator in the low energy theory. Um, because without this, I just get S i lambda. What is the effect of inserting this? It gives you something else. This will be the definition of the composite operator corresponding to the original operator here. Okay. Now the interesting thing is um, even a simple field phi will get modified in this definition. Okay. So uh, let me just show you that. So let's, as an example of a calculation, uh, so I, so let me choose this to be equal to phi. Okay. So what do you get? So you get this phi is, of course, if I add a source now, let's put a source there. It's um, j phi. It's d d phi uh, d d j of the uh, partition function. So I can write this as d d j. This is a full generating function, phi. So now I write it in terms of this, and I get this is and I've done this integral before I've written the answer. It's this uh, 1 by I did this last time. We did some change of variables and uh, wrote it in this form, the generating functional. So this is just d phi times delta by delta L times phi minus delta H times all this. So this term is the same phi that you had to begin with, d by dj brought a phi. In this, here also it's the same phi with some scaling. That scaling is the usual scaling. But you see there's an extra piece here. Okay. And uh, here it's kind of trivial. So what is this j? j, you can write as this whole thing, you can write as d d phi of this thing. Okay, so you write this as d d phi of e to the of j And then you can integrate by parts dd phi and act on that, act on the full action. So what do you get? Um, this 
plus that is the full action. So when you integrate by parts, this becomes d phi. This part is the same as before, delta by delta L phi. And then you get a piece uh, delta H times delta S lambda times all that. Okay. So I just integrated by parts on the S and I get that piece. So there's delta H, sorry, this is delta H times this j is just dd phi of that because that's what multiplies this. And then you integrate by parts and you get this. So the phi in your original theory, which I chose phi, in this theory is all this. Okay. So this is because of the interactions. So the interactions change phi. If you want, there are diagrams where your phi is, you write phi as phi L plus phi H. Okay. But the expectation value of phi h is not zero if you have interactions. You can get terms involving phi h times phi l cubed. And when you integrate it out, this gives you a propagator delta h. So you get corrections of the form phi l plus delta h phi l cubed, which is what this is. Okay. So this is the notion of a, it's a well, well defined notion. What, what is the operator here and what does it become here? Okay. So we have to do that for the number operator. The number operator, uh, what does it become in the low energy theory? And I'm, since we're running out of time, I'll just write down the answer. So then I'll just do that algebra quickly and that'll be the last thing I do. So d phi, what is the number operator? It's phi d d phi. So the number operator is going to act on correlation functions to measure how many terms there are, or any term. And j is what brings down, derivatives of j bring down the phi's times e to the power of minus s b phi. So now I want to re-express it in terms of an action on s lambda. So you, this is just j. So you write this outside here and you write this as d phi times phi times uh, all this okay but phi this acting on the bare theory in the low energy theory is the composite phi which we just derived so this is just uh, j phi in the low energy theory times s lambda. Now I'm going to the low energy theory using this, using this, because I know what the result is, s lambda phi plus, um, oh, I've got the answer, uh, what was this? Delta by delta L all this j Now I have to bring that j back in and I'll write the j as a derivative of this. So it'll be delta L by delta times the derivative of phi. So this will be d phi times delta by delta phi times the reverse of that acting on All that. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I think I missed. Oh, I actually I, I removed. I should have written. I put the J here, and I did the. Sorry, this should come outside. Let me erase that. I put the J here and write this as delta by. So I insert the J and write this as delta L by delta on okay then I integrate by parts and it acts on phi and s lambda so I get so integrate by parts
integrate this DD5 by part, so it will act on both this composite operator and the S. So it will give you, so I put that here. So it will finally give you, uh, integrating by part, you get a minus fine phi. times the rest of it. Okay. So this whole thing, this whole object is the composite operator corresponding to number, number operator. And I've already calculated for you what phi is. Phi is all this. This is this object phi. So if you work this whole thing out, let me write down the final answer. So the number operator becomes phi. This is the expected term, but it's modified by terms that involve So this is the this is the number operator that you should put here because it's acting on s lambda. It's not acting on the pair. So it's correction. So this is the original counting operator, and it has corrections proportional to this. Notice that when you go to very high energies, uh, this term drops out because of the delta l. So this goes away and it reduces to that. So, uh, so your fixed point equation is this, where n is all that. And uh, now you shouldn't be, uh, it may look very complicated, but remember that this part of the thing is already there here. The Wilson RG or the Polchinski RG already has terms of this type. It just modifies that a bit, okay? It's just an additional term. So the equation doesn't get more complicated. and. Um, Actually, you can write down an integral for this equation. Maybe I'll write that and stop. That'll be the last equation I write down. So what is the solution to this equation, to the evolution equation uh, of this? OK, which I, I'll just write that down. Only effect, only effect, only new thing is the presence of that eta. Okay. and this operator. Otherwise, it's the same equation that we had before, for which I wrote down the integral kernel. So I'll just stop by writing down the solution, psi n xf tf. by, uh, I'm defining an HF minus HI, in a minute. What is this HF? It's just a simple related to the G. 1 over H is 1 over G minus 1 over G naught. This is some reference G naught. So this is the G, the usual G. This is the G at some reference point. And 1 over h is defined like that. You put that in. When eta goes to 0, uh, this refuse, reduces to the old equation. So what is the new, new effect? New effect is these factors. Okay. So if you go back to that form, e to the power of minus half a t x f minus z x i squared, what is z now? Previously, z was g f by g i. Z is now the ratio of this term to this term is GF by GI times e to the power of minus eta by 2 okay this is the usual damping for high end momentum 
This is a momentum independent rescaling of your field, which you have to do because of eta. So that comes out of this. And uh, I'll stop here, but I'll just mention that if you, instead of this equation, if you go back to the original Wilson equation, you'll get an almost identical form of z uh, with the same eta. In fact, Wilson had put that in right in the beginning. Here we got it through this argument. So this is, this is the fixed point or the Polchinski equation with anomalous dimension included. Okay. Uh, there are other equations that people write down with anomalous dimension, but they're not as clean as this. The good thing about this is it uses this operator n, which has a nice property that it's a, it's a, it's a marginal, exactly marginal operator. In the sense, its eigenvalues are n. It doesn't change. It's just n. So it's a, it's a nice operator to have. Uh, and when you solve this equation, it turns out that all these complications go away and you get a nice uh, straightforward solution. Whereas if you write down those other equations, the equations look simpler. This operator is a naive, if you use a naive operator, the solutions become more complicated. This H will not have the simple algebraic form. It will be a complicated form. So there's some advantages to using this equation. So uh, let me conclude. So what's the, so now what do you do with all this? Well, you take the fixed point equation and you try to solve it order by order in lambda in, with some parameter and you will get an action. And in the process of getting an action, you'll get an eigenvalue equation for this, which will give you the anomalous dimension for the field. And, uh, and uh, so that's how eta is obtained. So that's how, for instance, you can get the Wilson-Fisher fixed point in, in this approach. You can get that by solving the equations and getting it. And OK, last word. Now, the reason I was interested in all this was because uh, this uh, evolution operator can be written as a functional integral. And then it looks like a five, this is a four dimensional theory. This looks like a five dimensional theory with time. And you can map this to, uh, by a field transformation. And it looks like a five dimensional scalar theory in ADS space. Okay. So, the motivation for reading up all this too was to understand how the anomalous dimension enters in ADS space, where it enters in a very natural way. Whereas here, uh, in the original formulation, that without the anomalous dimension, it doesn't show up. But once you put in the anomalous dimension, you can see the match. OK, so uh, what I will do is I will, some of the algebra that I didn't do on the board, I'll be there in my notes, and you can look at it in my homepage. So I guess I'll stop here.